may be seated. Well, it's been good, I think, all week long, and it seems like it's been such a short time already, but having Brother Roger Pauly here, he's been a pastor at Cranberry Baptist Church for just over 33 years. They've served very faithfully there, have a fantastic family. God has used them in a great way. I got to meet the pastor at the radio station that's there now, and he seems like a real great guy. I think he served as an assistant for a couple years under you and took the church now, so he's doing a great job. It's been a joy to be able to have him here this week. I think he's been a help to us already, and I'm looking forward to tonight's message and also tomorrow night's and just seeing what God has for us. So you pray for him as he comes and just gives us what God has laid on his heart. Amen. Thank you, my Lord. We're glad to be here. I'm glad that he said and emphasized again that we pastored for 33 years. So if you're expected uh, some plain evangelist to come through here with lots of stories and lots of jokes and lots of experiences, that's not me. Uh, but, uh, well, we've had lots of experiences, and if you pastor even at the time, you've got some too. you got some stories you can't even tell. But at any rate, <laughs> what a good it is to be uh, in the ministry. Uh, I grew up in a preacher's home and did not answer call to preach until I was 33, although my wife and I and our children were always involved in ministry, bus ministry, and, and going out on the soul winning, and teaching Sunday school classes, and Marshall was always over the ballroom, you know what that is, right? And uh, so it uh, doesn't mean partying, it means those are the ballroom in the back, so at any rate, uh, so we went to Cranberry, and that became one of those jobs as well. And uh, the first seven years, we were by vocation. I still worked in a job and traveling quite a bit, and um, the Lord just kept impressing the points that we needed to be full-time, and what a blessing it's been uh, to be able to be used by the Lord, and uh, see these other pastors here and preachers, uh, there's no greater calling uh, than to uh, give your heart and life completely, first of all, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then to surrender to preach and to be used by Him, and God wants to use all of us. You don't have to be a preacher. Uh, to uh, be used by the Lord. As a matter of fact, I just claimed for the longest time that I was just a lay speaker and that I believe that I could have a, a stronger voice possibly than some preacher with those expectations, but uh, the Lord saw differently. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me, please, to the uh, book of First Corinthians chapter number 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, as we look into God's Word. And tonight, we'll pick up in verse number 16. As we open God's Word, we discover that the Apostle Paul has written over half of the books in the New Testament. And as he pins these letters to the churches, he always has a definite purpose. It's not just about filling in the blanks or giving a, a diary of his place to where he's been or where he's going, uh, but always addressing something. As we turn to chapter 9, we understand that the Apostle Paul is discussing at length in the previous chapter, chapter 8, uh, of our liberty uh, that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank God that we're saved by grace plus nothing. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, however, after that we are saved, there are some things that we should be doing, and some things that we should not be doing. Uh, but at the same time, as a Christian, uh, we have a liberty within the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not bound, uh, but we have liberty uh, with the Lord, however, it's limited by the love that we have for Christ and the love that he has for us. The Bible reminds us it's the love of Christ that constraineth us. Uh, when we talk about the motives, and that's why we do uh, what we do, uh, that our liber liberty is limited by love. In chapter 8, in verse number 9, I will pick that one up, you'll see that there are some things that I will not do, even though I have the right to do. Uh, because somebody may be offended. This is what the Apostle Paul is discussing. Now let's read together uh, this passage of Scripture and keep this in mind that if our liberty causes someone to stumble as a Christian or someone who does not know the Lord to turn away and not ever accept Christ, then I'm accountable for that. Yeah. By the way, you're accountable as well. Uh, or epistles read of all men. And I realize that it's the tall trees that catch the most wind. And sometimes we think, well, somebody that's in authority and someone that is always before the people uh, is going to have more accountability. And we're going to have accountability regardless. But again, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, 
The Bible says to him it's sin. And so it's not about saying, well, I'm not going to do something because I, I don't want to be accountable. We are accountable. Right. And that we're led maybe to give ourselves completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pick up in verse number 16 of, again, 1 Corinthians 9. And the Bible says, the Apostle Paul is speaking in this passage of Scripture. But though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Merely that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. And for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, and that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Would you read verse 3 with me? The Bible says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be particular thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. Now therefore so run not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. I'd like you to underscore our verse for tonight, verse number 23, the first phrase, and this I do for the gospel sake. The Apostle Paul said clearly in this passage of Scripture, and that it is right for him to receive wages for preaching the gospel. But he said he will not take of those wages if it would dare cause someone to stumble or one not come to know Christ as their Savior. He reminds us in this passage of Scripture that all of us are going to be accountable just as the Apostle Paul is accountable. For example, here in, he, here in this chapter, Paul explains that the church had an obligation to support him and to provide his needs. However, rather than taking of that and feeling like he was obligated to that support, <laughs> Apostle Paul says that he would not take of that, lest it would hinder uh, the gospel. So as a Christian, we must realize that people are watching our lives. Sure. And as we said last night, and possibly the night before, uh, that we are epistles read of all men. Epistles, meaning letter, being the gospel. We are the only Bible uh, that others will ever read. They're watching our lives. Those who live in our neighborhood, those that we work with, those that we travel with, those that uh, we, we go to Walmart with, or they watch us. Maybe it's at a red light and you're a little impatient. Somebody's watching your line. And oftentimes we find ourselves, as soon as it turns green, if it doesn't turn green, I'm blowing the horn. But you never know he's in front of you watching your life and thinking, and he says he's a Christian. Just those little things in life. And we realize that all of us are being watched and understand beyond that. Now that we're going to stand before the Lord one day. And we're going to give an account of everything done in this body, be it good or bad. And so he chose rather, the Apostle Paul, uh, to make tents. He was a tent maker. All through his ministry. And so the real emphasis here is on evangelism, on evangelism. The message, again, this I do for the gospel's sake. Our life should be for the gospel's sake. You know, I owe the Lord Jesus Christ everything. There's no question about it. And the Lord has blessed us beyond measure. All of us can go 
down the list, and we're reminded so often of the song, count your many blessings, and name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see all that God has done. In just a few days, we'll celebrate Thanksgiving. It's the time again that we're giving thanks, and oftentimes we begin being more thankful around that time of the year than any other. But truth of it is, every day of our life, we ought to just thank the Lord for salvation. Thank Him and realizing that it's in Him that we live, move, and have our being. Knowing that without Christ that we're nothing at all. And we're not big eyes and little ears. We're all again children of God. And God has given every one of us an opportunity to serve Him. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, And for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, and how Christ died for our sins, According to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. The Apostle Paul, again, has given us the, the gospel in a nutshell, as we've already said. But would you write this statement down? If we believe that, do we believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ? Yes. And do we believe that Christ saved us by his precious blood? Yes. And do we believe that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us to teach us all things? Do we believe, again, that when we die, that the first place we understand we're going to go, of course, is heaven, and the first thing we're going to see is the Lord Jesus Christ? If we believe that, then I would say this to you, that what we believe should determine how we behave. What we believe should determine how we behave. The Apostle Paul says and reminds us here that we do so for the gospel's sake. Underscore in this passage of scripture of what we just read in verse 19, and you'll see it repeated over and over again. The passage talks about gaining or winning people uh, to Christ. He says that I might gain the more in verse 19. In verse 20, that I might gain the Jews. Later in verse 20, that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21, that I might gain them that are without law. Verse 22, that I might gain the weak. Notice verse 23. And he says, I'm doing all of this. And this I do for the gospel's sake. This I do for the gospel's sake. We're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse number 16. He said, But I would that you would understand. Understand. Well, that's Philippians 1 12. Excuse me. He said, I wish that you would understand, brother, the things which happened unto me. And have fallen out to the fathers of the gospel. I referred to it a lot of recent days in thinking about where we are in our life. And uh, I, I wasn't looking to preach, wasn't looking to pastor. Uh, but I look back and I see God's hand in all of that. All of that. And don't you wish that you could go back and do some things over? Uh, that you can, how many golfers do we have in the building? Any golfers like to play, all right? How many goopers in the <laughs> we got more goofers, and then we have golfers. Uh, but I like to get out and just uh, uh, knock around a little bit. I'm not a good golfer, but I like to get out and enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the fellowship. And um, I'm thankful that I, I play with enough preachers who are like myself. They're not good golfers, so they need a lot of mulligans, a lot of mulligans. How many know what a mulligan is, all right? A mulligan is if I get a do-over. I get a free do-over. It's not going to be charged against my score. When... This walk with the Lord, many times we wish the Lord would just give us a mark. <coughs> well, you don't need a mark because we're under grace. Amen. Amen. And keep this in mind that our sins are under the blood, past, present, and future. They're under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That word cleanseth in the King James Bible reminds us again, and I love the King James, amen? He reminds us that it's a continual process, that ETH. It just doesn't say cleanse, past tense, but it says cleanse up, meaning that it's a continual process that's going on in our life. And so the Apostle Paul says that this I do for the gospel sake. Can we say this ourselves, that what I'm doing in my life, is for the gospel's sake. And I want you to write down two or three things. First of all, we find in this passage of scripture a compelling motive. A compelling motive. He reminds us in this text that all of us are going to stand before the Lord one day. 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 reminds us it's appointed unto man once to die. After this, what? The judgment. We're going to stand and give an account of everything we've done in this body, be it good or bad. Now, before last, we talked from Matthew 16, 24, where he's referred to it several times. And we find that word come. Come now, let us reason together over in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah, he says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. But as he uses that word come over 3,000 times in the word of God, Matthew 16, 24, he says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so that's in the continual process as well. We come to the Lord, but he says, I want you to keep on coming. I want you to keep on following. I want you to keep on getting as close to me as you possibly could be. You know, there are times in my life, truthfully, that whenever I needed the Lord to hear and answer a prayer, that it seemed as if God was so far away. And someone reminded me many years ago, if God seems so far away, then guess who's moved? Because he does not move. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord thy God. I change not. But it's not a said change. And if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. If I find myself going away, may I say from the Lord, out of the Lord's presence, may I say he's going to speak to my heart. There's nothing like being in fellowship with the Lord. Amen? Yes. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, again, is cleansing us, constantly cleansing us. There are times in my life where I don't seem as close. Well, it's not God's fault, but that's mine. It's about yielding ourselves, again, completely to the Lord. The Apostle Paul's emphasis here is not about himself, but it's about others. Thus, he would not take of the offerings. He would not take uh, the pay. He says again, less again, that he should offend someone. This I do uh, for the gospel's sake. There was a compelling motive, all right, but beyond others, he knew one day he was going to stand before the Lord. And we're all going to stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. He desired the Lord's approval. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We all like to be accepted, don't we? We like people to like us. Now don't look at me like you don't like us. You don't care what people like you or not. We all want people to like us. And we wonder sometimes, I wonder why they didn't speak to me. I wonder why they don't talk to me. Is there something about me that they don't like? Well, it could be. But look, that's just temporal. Uh, what we need to be concerned about is the Lord again. And if we're accepted, amen, uh, scars and all, we're accepted. Regardless of where we've been, we're accepted. And this is what Paul reminds us, we're accepted in the beloved. We all desire that approval. Not only do we have an appointment, we understand that we desire to hear him say, well done, yes. about good and faithful servant. But would you like this not down? There is an appearance one day. For the Bible says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. We're going to stand before the Lord and be accountable to the Lord. And therefore, there must be some reason. He said, there's a compelling motive is what I'm saying to you. There's a compelling motive that what I do is for a reason. Paul says, and this I do for the gospel's sake. Though oftentimes we do things because we're selfish. We do things because we want to look good in front of others. We do things because we want some benefit. We do things so that we get something in return. We do things so that our children will turn out right. We do things, again, that they do not understand, but it is for their good. And I think about that and say that now. He said, I, I want you to realize that I'm not doing this because I want to do this, but you need this. My daddy was a good man. But my daddy, he didn't take time to sit down and talk to us before we got a hoover. It was not a spanking. It was not a discussion. It was not time out. With my daddy, it was time in. No question about it. You better get in the ring 
And if you start running from him, buddy, you're going to get another one. I, I can see us now. You know, I'm, I'm pulling away and daddy's going like this and he's whipping me all the time like that. Mama, she would just get a switch and she didn't mind where it hit you either. And, uh, you know, a lot of times my mama, when she would go to the refrigerator, she wasn't going after an ice cream. She had that switch right on top of the refrigerator. How many know what I'm talking about? Daddy did not take those classes of how to train up children properly and, and how to discipline them properly. Uh, I tell them at home that I was raised very patriotic. I'm talking about stars and stripes. <laughs> <laughs> and I got the stripes to do it, amen. Understand this, the Lord's going to chase at his own. And the Bible says he chases to be lost. And may I say that the Lord desires that we come to him. Uh, I, I remember uh, the first time that, that I spanked Scotty, I never will forget it. How many of you remember when you, you spanked your children? Let's see, did you raise your hand? All right. I tell you what. He went to his room and cried, and I went to my room and cried. How many know what I'm talking about? It was like, it hurt me. Now, he would tell you today, no, it hurt me worse than it hurt you, Dad. But I knew what we got. And I remember that day, it was much like the way I grew up. I mean, Daddy, he would discipline and ask questions later. And he didn't mind to say, I'm sorry I did that because I thought you was in the wrong. And you weren't, but you probably needed to be. Now, that's, kind of, that's what I do. But to be able to discipline a child will remind you how the Lord disciplines us. And so after that first woman, I reminded myself of my own dad. And it hurt me. Scott went to his room and cried. Marsha went to her room and cried. And I went to my room. And so Marsha and I talked about it, and, and we decided early on that if we were going to discipline our children, let's ask the Lord to help us. You know, God wants to guide us. God wants to direct us. And we can come to Him for anything. And our Heavenly Father knows exactly what to give us. And so the Lord taught us, instead of counting to ten, instead of giving time out, and the first thing that we would do is just say, okay, Scotty, you know what you've done? Yeah, I don't know. And you know what he said? Yeah, I don't know. He said, well, we're going to pray. Yeah. Okay. I know what you know. There's something about praying with your child before you discipline them. Mm -hmm. Just think with me for a moment. I know this is not a family conference, but just think with me. There's something that will happen. I, I'm glad the Lord... When he disciplines us, he doesn't do it to get back at us. That's right, it is. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do it to, to show us who ball, who's boss. Mm -hmm. But he disciplines us to change our behavior. Amen? That's right. And so when we discipline a child, it's to change the behavior. And I remember that first time that we did just this. I said, okay, Scott, you know what he's at? Yeah, sure. Well, he thinks we're just going to take the bell off and let him in. I said, well, we're going to pray. And we're going to ask God to help us. Okay, Daddy. I said, let's go down. Okay, Daddy. And I said, I want you to pray first. Wow. You talk about getting a hold of your heart. And Scott's crying out for mercy. <laughs> <laughs> he's, crying. he's crying for mercy. But he's asking God to forgive. I want you to know there's something different about discipline in that manner that the Lord helped us with many years ago. And again, to train up the child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. But understand that when we are disobedient to the Lord, there's an action that's going to take place. The Apostle Paul said, This I do for the gospel's sake. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your conscience. One day, I'm going to stand before the righteous judge. And I want to hear him say, well done. Yes. And I want to be used to the Lord. I must be careful of my actions of what I do and what I don't do. How I respond. Uh, write these two words down, and you tell me. Respond or react. 
I believe this, that it's more than just counting the ten. I believe as a Christian, before we get upset with someone at work and we want to just give them a piece of our mind, have you ever done that? Has anybody ever done that to you? Just give you a piece of their mind? That's what's wrong with most people in West Virginia. We've given too many pieces away. Yeah. But understand this. What we need to do is to, is to change the behavior. And so as a Christian, when we come to the Lord, may I say, when we just cry out to the Lord, I want you to know God hears and answers prayers. We can change the behavior with our children. And God wants to change our behavior as well. Reacting or respond. And so in my mind, to react, that's the flesh. To respond, that's to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within us. To ask God to help us before I speak. At times that we've had to go to a home and, and talk to folks about something that was going on in their life. Or a couple comes in and they're, they're fighting and, and they're ready to break up and end up in the divorce court. Well, are we going to react? Are we going to take sides? Or are we going to respond? Oh, what are we going to do? I want you to know God has the answer. God knows exactly what we need to do. And it's about casting all of your care upon him for he cares for you. So when the Apostle Paul said, and this I do for the gospel's sake, there was a compelling motive. And then secondly, I want you to know there was a constraining love that was there. A constraining love. For many years prior to entering the ministry, I was in sales. And so back in my early 20s, learning about sales, we learned immediately uh, that we all have five buying motives, or really five motives that causes us to do everything that we do in life. If you think about it, five. Five motives that move us to make decisions. One is pride, profit, fear, love, and need. Those five things, everything that we buy, everything that we do in our life, are based generally on those five things. Pride, profit, fear, love, or need. But I want you to know, when we think about these five motives, there's one that stands out when we are in line with the Lord. And the Bible says that the love of Christ constraineth us. When we think about the constraining love here, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. Christ died for all of us. And there's no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. Well, but we were ungodly. And we were wretched. And we were on our way to a devil's hell. But the Lord Jesus Christ loved us enough to go to the cross. <laughs> Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're talking about the love of Christ. Paul says, Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall dis or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? The question mark? No, to none of those. Knowing that it's the love of Christ that constraineth us. The Bible reminds us that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first commandment. And the second is likened to this commandment. Amen. To love thy neighbor as thyself. We're talking about this one. So when Paul says that this I do for the gospel's sake, there is a compelling motive there. And he recognized the need. But there's also a constraining love. I want you to know, we do what we do because we love the Lord. Amen. You're in church tonight. Why? Because you love the Lord. Some may be here because mommy said, well, come on. Amen. But daddy said, well, come on. Uh, but you'll never regret the day mom and dad led you to the Lord Jesus Christ and brought you up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Thank God for it. Amen. But keep this in mind. There comes a time in our life as adults, as a Christian, a mature Christian, we act the way we act and do what we need to do. We do again because we love the Lord. We talked about it the other night, about those five things that should be in all of our lives as a Christian. As we would study of the Word of God, a Lord would need us not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. That we would spend time with the Lord in prayer, pray without ceasing. 
and that we would witness to others, telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we would give of ourselves back to the Lord and find ourselves giving the, the, the tithe back to the Lord. All of it belongs to Him. But we're to bring the tenth, we're to bring the tithe to the Lord, and then to not forsake ourselves to the house of the Lord. Those five things are so important. In the life of a Christian. Could I get an amen there, sir? Amen. Now understand this. That only happens not because of duty, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The love of Christ constraineth us. And when we find ourselves going away from that love, you've lost your first love. Yeah. It's about coming back and renewing that commitment and that promise that the Lord promised us that He'd never leave us. And so many times we make promises. There's a compelling motive, the Apostle Paul says, this I do, for the gospel's sake. There's a constraining love. And then I want you to write this down. There's a consecrated call. A consecrated call. The word consecration just simply means set apart. And I believe it goes beyond just set apart. It's set apart from something, that's the world, to someone, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Woe unto me. If I preach not the gospel of Christ, the Apostle Paul said. His life changed on the road to Damascus, remember? Here was a man that was chasing down those little Christians, those little Christ, chasing them down, murdering them. But on the road to Damascus, something happened. God spoke to his heart. God again knocked him off his horse with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's reminded again, but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a what? A chosen vessel unto the Lord. I love John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. As a child of God, we have responsibility. You might say, I'm just a parishioner. I'm just a member of the church. But may I say, we put it back to the preacher. We put it back to the deacons. We put it back to those that are leaders within the church. But we all have a responsibility of telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say right. that? Right. It's about, again, winning the loss at any cost. That we would let our light so shine that others would see Christ in me. May I say, we are the only Bible that many people will ever read. And that's our lives. May the love of Christ constrain us and understand that we too have a consecrated call. Romans chapter 12, and verse number 1, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I believe we read it last night. He says, a living sacrifice. And then he goes on and says, which is what? Get your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's about giving all to the Lord. All, my friend, it's not about you. It's about why Christ has left you here. Right, right. And all of us have a responsibility. Let me move on. This is not only a compelling motive, and a consecrated or constraining love, and a consecrated call, but a written down with a confident message. The Apostle Paul said, this I do for the gospel's sake. Romans chapter 1, if you'd like to look with me, in verse number 15. He says, so as much as in, as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Would you read that next line with me? For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And so as a child of God, we have a responsibility. Maybe be with the Apostle Paul and simply say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That I'm living for Christ. This I do for the gospel's sake. Let this be a theme within our home, within our Christian life, that everything that I do is for the gospel's sake. That this church would stand and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Any person that's a part of it, it'll continue to grow. Why? For the gospel's sake. And that other people would come to their Christ. Acts chapter 4. I love the book of Acts, don't you? When you come to Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, the Bible says that when they had prayed, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they spake the word of God. The Bible says, as they were what? Filled with the Holy Ghost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. <laughs> boldness. The Holy Spirit 
that lives and dwells within me. And there are people that want to argue about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever asked you that question? Oh, so you're a Christian. Yes, yes. Where do you go to church? Do you tell them? And then they would ask, have you got the Holy Ghost? <laughs> have you ever been asked that? Yes, have you got the Holy Ghost? First time I heard that, somebody asked me that, you know what I said? Like a dodo? No, we don't believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew what they were talking about. But my answer sounded like, we didn't believe in the Holy Ghost. Oh, we believe in the Holy Ghost. And it's not about the Holy Ghost, again, me having the Holy Ghost. It's about the Holy Ghost having me, yes, having right. you. It's about being emptied out of self and being filled with the Spirit of God. So when somebody asks you, and then you believe in the Holy Ghost, you believe, oh yeah, He lives and dwells within me. Amen? It's, understand it's in Him that we live, move, and have our being. Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, but it's about being emptied out of self. And so I've written down, and when we talk about all of these things, that it's about a consuming spirit that is in us. We're to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to obey the Spirit of God, to be filled with the Spirit of God, to know the power of the Spirit of God according to the power that worketh in us. And so we, when we understand that this I do for the gospel's sake, a compelling motive? Is there a motive? Sure there is. It's the love of Christ that constraineth us, constraining love, a consecrated call, a confident message that we have. That the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, to share it with others. How can I do that? By being consumed with the Spirit of God, being emptied out of self, and yielding these members, as we said earlier in the week, of unrighteousness to righteousness, mm -hmm. and allowing God to use us in a wonderful way. It's an amazing thing. What God can do in all of our lives. Yes, I mean. I look back and I realize again that God had a plan all along. And we just had to catch up to it. And sometimes we're so far behind. But whenever we draw an eye to God, He's promised us that He will draw an eye to you. You can be as close to the Lord, and I can be as close to the Lord as I desire to be. Amen. Amen. And if God seems so far away, guess who's me? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord that God. I changed him. And so let me give you one last thought. And this I do for the gospel's sake. There must be a committed cause to understand why I'm here. All the way from verse 19 down, of our text in verse 23, we find there is a cause that he might gain the more. That he might gain the Jews. That he might gain them and that are without the Lord. That he might gain the weak. And you and I have a great opportunity to share this good news that they will come to know Christ and truth is, when the preacher knocks on the door, you say, well, Lord, that'll do it. If anybody's able to win them to the Lord, it's the preacher. I promise you, the preacher will tell you, other preachers will tell you, you have a greater opportunity than a man who stands behind the pulpit because that's his job. <laughs> it's one bigger. I'll say it again. Somebody told me like this, never repeat. I said, never repeat for emphasis. So understand, it's one beggar who's found crumbs. Got with another beggar yeah. where to find the crumbs. And show them the Lord Jesus Christ. The committed calls. And this I do for the gospel's sake. The Apostle Paul says, I have adapted to their customs. In order that I might gain the Jews. The goal is not heaven. The goal is in winning others. Right, yes. Paul did not compromise. <clears throat> Amen. Compromise, may I say, is where you set aside the truth. Yeah. Paul was not a man pleaser, but he said, this I do for the gospel's sake. You might be called a holy roller. 
You might be called that church goer. You might be called even a little preacher. But this I do for the gospel's sake. We understand the Apostle Paul when he said in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, For I do now persuade men or God. Or do I speak to please men? Or if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You see, self-denial. And the other thing that we can talk about is self-control. We can talk about self-discipline. Uh, but just sum it up. It's about a commitment. It's about a commitment. Thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know the boundaries of my tribe. We say. I know why the Lord Jesus Christ has left me here. And I know why he has all of us here. He desires again that we give him others. And this I do for the gospel's sake. Let's pray, man. I hear the And as we sit quietly for just a moment, do my stand. I know you've been saying for a little while. But I want us to pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God. It's a reminder once again, not only what you have done for us, but why you've left us here. And now Lord, I pray that in this room, these dear folks, who've been so faithful, so kind, to listen each night. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their testimony. But now, Lord, I pray that you would reach down within each of our hearts and speak to us about being used by you. Now, Lord, whatever that it is that we may need to give up or to put on, put off or put on, may it be for one reason. This I do. For the Gospels. Help us, I pray individually, and as a church. <clears throat> Maybe think just now of people that we work with, people that are neighbors, people that are within our own family, our friends, that come to our mind and do not know Christ. And they're blindly groping in the darkness trying to find what life is all about. And we have the answer. Lord, help us. As we stand up the quiet And even before the pianist begins to play, if God is putting your heart and you're sincerely you're praying for someone, no one's looking around and praying, but you're praying for someone and God can use you, then I want you to find your place around this altar. Maybe there's some things that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. You say, I need to make some decisions. And this I do for the gospel's sake, for the cause of Christ. Would you step out and come? Just step out and come right now, even before the end begins to play. Would you come? God bless you. Our preacher's coming. If you're here tonight and you do not know Christ as your Savior,